why do so many of us choose partners that are elusive or, or just make us chase? You know, it, it seems like it's, it's an epidemic where everybody's just, they want somebody that doesn't want you back. I, I would say that it was probably the generation above is responsible for that. I would say that the there might not have been uh, what happened before in generations before and before and before. You may not have the most idyllic upbringing, but you would choose somebody who's relatively local to you, and you'd be limited in options. And so you'd find someone who's also limited in options, and you just stick to that person, and then you'd get on with life. The rise of the broken homes and the rise of like a choice means that now we allow our own kind of insecurities to make our decisions. Where our deepest, darkest insecurities and brokenness is now our decision maker. If we are no longer confined by time, space, parental imp- uh, approval, approval, nothing. So we just allow our traumas to decide our partners. And so if we grew up with any kind of brokenness or any kind of trauma or anywhere where we felt like we had to earn love, the only thing we'll look for is someone that can recreate and reincarnate those feelings of not feeling good enough. And when we meet somebody who makes us feel good enough, we start to question their judgment because we're thinking, why are you making this so easy for me? But somebody who reminds us that we're unlovable, we're unattractive, we're not the only one, is probably the person that we're going to select because that's where we're coming from. We bring this childhood into our adult lives. It's interesting because last time you spoke about arranged marriages, Mm -hmm. it's almost like that's a better formula for success than letting people choose who they're when, who they think is a good mate. And weirdly, it seems to be the only formula that might work in this day and age. Because your parents, your parents are going to know what's best for you and they're going to choose. They're not going to allow you to let your ego decide. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to allow it. Instead, what they're going to look for is similar, of, yeah. uh, similarity. So they'll look for someone who they think is similar to you and think that will fit in with them and as a result will be more compatible. So I'm not, I'm not saying that it's the only way, but I don't know what the alternatives could be because leaving people to their own free will hasn't been working. No. Mm. Would you ever do that for your daughters? Um... I mean, it's not acceptable. It's not socially yeah, acceptable. It's not but socially acceptable. my youngest daughter had a boyfriend that my, her mother and I just loved. Aww. Just thought he was the greatest. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, that, that was her first love, and it didn't, didn't work out. But it was like we, we were both approving, even, but, even though this is her first boyfriend. How, you know, how often do you marry your first boyfriend? Yeah. But, you know, as a parent, can you get an instinct when someone's right and wrong for your child? Yeah, I think so. Yeah? It's yeah. like a natural judgment? Yeah, I think yeah, so. I yeah, I think so. You, you can well. do it for anybody, any yeah. your, your friends. I guess so. Yeah, you can do it pretty much for I'm, I'm a very good judge of character, so you can sense when somebody is real. Yeah. And you can I, sense when does somebody that is good certain. judge of character extend to your own personal relationships or more when for well? uh, Yes, but I, I still <laughs> will. Will. I'll, I'll still get involved with, with shady <laughs> characters myself sometimes. myself included. Yeah. Less, <laughs> less than uh, honorable intentions sometimes. <laughs> I, I, you know, all kinds of crazy things happen in life and... Uh, I was a late bloomer. I was yeah. a really late bloomer, so I didn't have my fun in my 20s and 30s. Mm-hmm. And I, then I got married. Mm-hmm. So I'm having. It, well, it, more that fun that now. can be a lot of men's journey. They're a late bloomer. And um, so their teenage years, they didn't access many women. And as they age and they become more successful and they become more handsome, they get a plethora of options that they never had before. And it's almost like the child in them is feeling like they have to explore this, they have to explore this, and they have to explore the girl that they could have never got when they were a teenager. She becomes the most attractive person, the person that like she would have never looked at me when I was a kid. She becomes the most um, important person in the room to him now. So it can lead to a, um, a sequence of erratic choices because they're almost doing teenage stuff as they get older. I'm not saying you did that, no, but a lot of people. And would you recommend being married in your 20s and 30s? Mm. For me, uh, I mean, if you meet that right person, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yep. But you you got to be so ready to grow mm. and change because you're you're gonna change. Yeah. The relationship is no longer gonna be like, oh, you're you're really sexy and hot, and I like yeah. spending time with you, which is a big driver for men, mm-hmm. probably for women too. But then after a while, I see my parents' relationship. It wasn't that my mom is gone now. My dad misses my mom terribly Mm -hmm. he doesn't miss her because she was so hot (laughs) which she was yeah when she was younger but he misses her because she was just so real and so great i think that's sometimes the key ingredient for men to get through the long stages and the decades of marriage is you almost have to accept the monotony of life 
it's going to get exactly. monotonous and women are going to get monotonous and they aren't going to be so sexually attractive. The men that struggle are the ones that just can't come to that realization and we have this entitlement, um, men and women, that you should always be desiring your partner and be desirable. But desirability is unsustainable. We're, we're a generation of spoiled brats. Spoiled. Unfortunately, desirability has to be replaced with duty, duty of care. But because we've got this idea that we should always desire our partner and they should always desire us, and if that's missing, the whole relationship is useless, we forget the duty of care and then we just start again. We're looking for the novelty of new relationships rather than the uh, monotony of existing stable ones. Sometimes I look at, like in the United States, I'll look at what young men had to go through in mm -hmm. their lives. Like my you know, older generations, they, they were lucky to not go to Vietnam or lucky mm -hmm. to not go to World War II. Maybe their timing was such that they didn't have to go off to, to war. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they met a nice girl and maybe they got married and had some kids and had a job and, and grew old together. Yeah. But now we're so spoiled. We have, we have no wars that we're going to unless yeah. you enlist. There's not enough responsibility. Yeah, no responsibility. Men without courage, mm -hmm. men without balls, men without a backbone. Yeah, and responsibility is really essential for men. I think the um, men, in order to become a man, what separates them from being a boy to a man is responsibility. And because we're prolonging the age of when they become fathers, or prolonging the age they become providers, or we're prolonging the age they become husbands, they become old teenagers for a really long time and they're avoiding responsibility. It's a strange generation where men really avoid responsibility and are terrified of like commitment and terror. And you're just thinking, before men would be terrified of going to war, which was a real thing, now they're terrified of labeling their relationships and it's, we've weakened them. They, they're terrified of responsibility. I'm not saying that there's lots of plenty of great women, but I'm just saying the avoidance of responsibility will stop you from entering your manhood. Mm -hmm. No, in Los Angeles you'll see, it's the state bird in Los Angeles is the uh, 40, 50 year old man dressed like a 12 year old boy. Yeah, is that a real thing? Because I always think that's like cartoon stuff, but that really happens. No, it really happens. It really happens, yeah, that's very true. So I think that's probably one of the key problems that we're facing. I'd like to thank BetterHelp for being a sponsor of today's video. I think a lot of my viewers are going through things, just like we all are, whether you're a viewer or not of this channel. I think everybody goes through something. And whether it's depression or anxiety or you're just going through a tough period of your life, talking with a professional can be really helpful. You know, personally, I go through just the stress of talking to so many people that are going through tough times, tough, tough stories, is hard on me. And, and talking with a therapist is, is really helpful. So I, I just started doing that recently. It's, it's been really great for me. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of therapy. And with BetterHelp, you can have your therapy session as a phone call or a video session, or even messaging if you prefer. Whatever is most comfortable for you. I did mine as, as video, which is great. It's, it's just like being in their office, but you're doing it from the comfort of your own home. And my BetterHelp therapist has been wonderful. Right, right from the get-go, he, he kind of figured out what my, what my deal is and was really helpful. And what's great about BetterHelp is you get paired with a therapist. You're matched within 48 hours in most cases. If you're just not feeling it with your therapist, you can try another one. Or you can try as many times as you like until you find someone that you're comfortable with. And you can do that at no additional charge, which is really nice. So if you'd like to join the over 4 million people that have taken charge of their mental health by talking with an experienced BetterHelp therapist, you can actually get 10% off by going to betterhelp.com forward slash soft white underbelly or click on the link in the video description box below. Thank you for watching and now back to the video. What advice would you give to somebody who's going through a breakup? Um, my always my advice for people that when they're going through breakups is literally leave the relationship as if the whole relationship was your own fault. It's entirely your fault and the reason I encourage um, kind of unwavering accountability is that's the only way you'll make changes. One of the trends that we've kind of seen in the latest last couple of years is everybody's ex-husband or ex-wife is a narcissist. Everybody's a narcissist and the reason why I'm so against that is it kind of and devours personal responsibility. You are no longer responsible for your poor choices. That person's simply a narcissist. That person's a, you know, a psychopath. It's got nothing to do with your selection. When really, the only reason we find ourselves in bad relationships is because we select poorly. Outside of your relationships with your parents and your children, everybody else is selected. So if you're selecting a narcissist, you have an addiction to being a victim. 
you like the abuse, you're choosing it. Now, I'm not saying it as an insult, I'm saying there is a part of you that is selecting this level of abuse. Now, if you leave every relationship as if it's just their fault, you did nothing wrong, oh, I was just a victim of narcissism, you're not going to learn the traits that caused you to attach to this toxic person and then you're not you're going to repeat the pattern. And this is one of the reasons why women that um, get divorced and deprive their partner, like from an abusive partner for example, that when they deprive or separate from the man and they don't allow him to have access to the children, the children are more at danger and they're more likely to get sexually abused and they're more likely to be physically abused. And women will say, I, I blocked access because I was trying to protect my children. But we know those children are more at risk. And the reason being is because that woman didn't reflect on her choices. She didn't reflect on her decision making. She just simply chose an abusive partner. Oh my God, he's so bad. You're never seeing the kids again. Never doing this. I'm protecting the kids. The children are now exposed to a different form of abuse. So if we don't reflect, we repeat. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, you know, when I got divorced, I guess it was like seven, seven or eight years ago now, mm -hmm. I, rather than pointing a finger blaming this person, that person, anyone, I just took 100% of the responsibility for everything. Yeah. Everything. It all helped. my fault. Yeah. And by doing that, I mean, it wasn't all my fault, but, yeah. but that's how I looked at it for many years up until just maybe recently. And by doing that, I was able to do things very differently and change my life and I'm in a better position now than I think I've ever been. What did you learn from doing that? Just not to be re not to be careless, not to be reckless, to be um, you know, to have discipline. Yeah, that's a good one. To Discipline's learn, a great one. I mean, it's like yeah. I, I, I probably I've always had great discipline, but now I have tremendous discipline. Like I'm not going to let anything get to me that they shouldn't be mm -hmm. and when i mean what i mean by accountability is not like oh my god it's all my fault let me try and fix it with that person it's all my fault because i ignored every red flag every single red flag and one thing i always say is women they never lie neither do men men and women do not lie they tell you the truth they always and lie <laughs> you think that but they show you the truth Oh, I see. Verbally, they might lie. Verbally, they might lie. But you know what it is? Your behaviors, your mannerisms, your aura, your energy, your um, uh, habits, they don't lie at all. So every time I have a man or a woman that come to me and they say I was, you know, with a narcissist and they were this and they were that, blah, blah, blah. And I said, what happened on the first date? What happened in the first week? And they'll say, no, they were great. They were fantastic. And I said, no, no, no think carefully. What actually happened? Well, the first time I met him, he was in a relationship. He was married at the time. I was like, there you go. They showed you they were, they were able to live two lives. Or the man will say, the first time I met her, she was in a strip club. She was a stripper. But, but I was like, there you go. Did she lie to you or did she show you who she was? She showed you. And we, men and women, we all do this. We all show every red flag that we're going to bring to the table. And we pick the person who is either naive enough to believe us or compatible with our red flags. Yeah, it could be either or. And we pick that person. So we don't need to lie. We show them and they accept the truth. They just don't accept it, literally. Sometimes I think, that, and it's not just social media, it's also like there was magazines and television mm. that exposed us to so many people, so, yeah. many, so many attractive people. Yeah, only we, attractive people. Only right? attractive yeah. people, really. And, and we just got used to looking at that and that's what we longed for mm -hmm. and we got to a point where we're not going to accept anything other than that yeah and that's not meant for a lot of us it's not meant for you and here's the thing if you have to pay for an attractive partner in installments of your self-respect because they keep degrading you they keep cheating on you it's not worth it i don't know you know what i i have to say and i really want to preface this i understand sometimes some people are a privilege because they might just have the options that, and a lot of women i'm not talking about all women but a lot of women majority of the time when they walk into a room and they like the look of a man chances are he'll like you back so we don't really know what the rejection feels like and we don't know what it's like to long after somebody that is not interested in you but one thing I can guarantee you it's not going to feel good no matter how beautiful she is the treatment you receive is what you should focus on as much as you she might make you look good in public if she treats you badly in private it's never worth it do, do, do women feel the pain of rejection the way a man does overweight women do and I know this sounds really un offensive, overweight women do. What happens with overweight women, they'll only tell you this when they lose the weight. 
and they'll see a huge difference in how men treat them. They go from being either invisible or treated like one of the boys and given some like human kind of interaction to now being really, really stared at and adored and all these things. And that jump makes them realize how much of a difference, a reaction you get from men based on your body. So uh, and it can really, really mess with them, yeah? Because they almost have the self-esteem of somebody who is really overweight, but they're getting the attention of somebody who's really beautiful and they don't know how to select. They simply don't know how to select because their self-esteem is still low, but their appearance is, uh, is still attractive. So I think women have that experience of rejection. And here's what it looks like more for women. And this is why they compete with each other. Women are only truly rejected when they're around more attractive women. If you're just by yourself as an unattractive woman, you walk down the street, nothing happens. No worries, you go home, mind your business. But when you walk down the street with a beautiful woman and you see how she's treated by other men, or you go to a club with a beautiful woman, or you go for dinner with a beautiful woman and men are just flocking to her, that's when they experience the rejection the most, which is one of the reasons why attractive women tend to flock together. Because when you're with uh, women that are considerably less attractive, they feel uncomfortable with that disparity in treatment. But, and men are so, they're so forgetful. They'll see a beautiful girl, they'll ignore all their friends and just home in on one. They might throw the odd compliment here and there, but really they mean it to one. So they can be quite harsh with that as well. So that's when they feel it the most. Yeah, for, for men, I, I can tell you, it's like when you get rejected by, by an attractive woman, you, I remember, I can remember this happening when I was younger. It's, it's like, you are being judged. Like you are not meant to reproduce on this planet. Is that how you feel? That's how you feel. Like you're just not. You're. You, it's like you. You're. It's not like this girl's just not right for you. Yeah. It's like no girl is right for you. Well, one thing I would say. And this is going to sound super offensive, and I'm going to be careful with how I word it. I grew up in London, very, very multicultural, and I'm because of my ethnicity is not very clear. I could essentially be some from Middle East. I could be from Pakistan. I could be from India. I could maybe even be parts of Eastern Europe. Whatever people can't really tell. So what would happen is I would get interest from men from all different cultures. And I noticed such a big difference in men from that. And one thing I always have noticed, and I know this sounds really offensive, I tell men that the, there is a huge difference culturally in how men handle rejection. Now, when a, a man, and I, I, it's same in America, what I have noticed is men from Hispanic culture or more African Caribbean culture, when they get rejected, they handle it perfectly. And that's why they have so much success with women. They laugh that you're saying no to them and they go back and try again. And that's why they're so desired by women. If you meet, one of the things that you hear online. Yeah, I've, I've uh, seen this in South America. You'll see it in South America. It's crazy. This is what happens when you go to South America or when you go in, in areas where there's a large African American society, whatever it is. You, you go walk past and go, damn, you look great. Sorry, I have a husband. He's a lucky guy. Have a great day. And they move on to the next. Simple. And as a result, they have, there's always women in their world. What happens to other men from different kind of cultural backgrounds, they place their social validity on her response. If she says no to him, oh my gosh, she's the only girl in the world, I'm never going to get a girl again, oh my god, I'm never doing this again. I always say to them, just emulate that behavior that you see in Hispanic men that you see. Yeah. In if you emulate that behavior, because what, what I found fascinating when I was in South America, I'd have a man literally proposing to me, making me feel like I'm the only woman in the world. Two minutes later, I'd turn over and he's talking to another girl. And I'd be like, I didn't even finish rejecting you. How did you move on so fast? They move on so quickly because they realize there's more humans in the world. And because they have that mentality, they never, ever allow a woman to make them feel like, you know, he's nothing. Oh. And they never get too attached too quick. Yeah, or, or I've seen a guy approach a girl, yeah. you know, make it clear that he's interested. She'll tur she turns him down. He just laughs at it and doesn't, he, he's not even phased by her rejection. He just keeps at it, keeps at it, and she's just laughing at him. Yeah. And eventually he becomes so charming because... He's fun and he's he doesn't charming and, and eventually she gives in. He, he doesn't personalize. Here's what happens when we reject a man. We're seeing whether our rejection confirms what he thinks about himself or it disproves what he it's thinks like, about it's himself. It's like he knows he's worthy. He knows he's worthy. So what will happen in some men, you reject them and they'll be like, well, are you sure you're missing out? You know, there's a great, you know, wait, are you sure you want to say no to <laughs> it's, it's a great and response. And it's that kind of response that we're feeling like he knows something I don't. And as a woman, and this is going to sound very crude, there is something that men know that we don't. 
yeah, biologically, physically, if you know what I'm talking about. So when he gives that attitude, like, are you sure you don't want this because you're in for a treat if you do, we get the impression that this person's successful at women, right, not in life, at women. But when he's like, oh God, oh, 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 he gets all nervous and now he's upset for a couple of days and he can't stop beating himself up and replaying, we're just, we're confirming the belief that he has about himself that he's not good enough. So we're looking to see what your self-belief is with the rejection. And again, this is all unconscious. Women don't know that they, they're doing this. They get to this. do testing from women yeah, too, right? Yeah, te you're testing to see your self-belief. When you act like my rejection is my loss, there must be something about you that's interesting. And that's what we attach to. Tell me, tell me about women uh, testing men. Well, unfortunately, it's what we kind of are designed to do. Here's the thing, biologically, we having a child with somebody, just remember there's no anesthetic in evolutionary times, there's no hospitals, there's nothing like that. Childbirth could literally, very literally mean death. So if you're gonna reproduce with a man, which is one of the reasons I think like the advent of contraceptives have really changed women's attitude. But before that, it would be, if I reproduce with you, it's life or death. This is a really, really important decision. So we would have to test him to see his tolerance levels and his boundaries and his ability to, you know, kind of soothe emotions. We're testing everything to see if he can lead the situation. Now, the problem is to pass the test, you have to have more stable emotions than her. And what I mean by that is, if I say to you, fuck you, this, and then you start saying, fuck you, that, and it becomes a whole big mess, we don't like that. But at the same time, if you just sit back and take it, we don't like that either, because I mean, we need somebody who won't be as emotional as us, but won't allow us to get excessively emotional because he has boundaries. And it's finding that balance, which is so hard for a man. I completely, I don't know how I would handle it if I was a man, but it's a case of you want to show her that you're not as erratic as her, but at the same time, you don't tolerate this level of erraticism, even though she's pushing you and pushing you. And it's a really hard thing to do because some women will really, really test you and you want to explode. But we're looking for you to stay calm in those situations, but also not accept those situations. We don't mean so calm that you roll over and let us do it again and again. You don't accept it, but you also don't stoop to it. And that's what we're kind of looking for in that moment, which is very hard to achieve. Yeah, the, the dynamics of, of romantic relationships are so, so different from men and women. Yeah. With men, they almost increase in value as they get into their 30s, 40s, mm. 50s, and 60s. And, and with women, it's the opposite. It is the opposite, but here's what I would say. As men age, they might increase in value, but they still struggle more in relationships because their selection gets worse. So what happens is, look, as they increase in value, at 30, at 30 years old, attractive, successful, whatever it is, lots of women are interested in him. As he gets to 50, more successful, less, less attractive, but more successful. But you're going you're, you're to have more women, you might have more women, but you're going to have more gold digging women. So what happens is as they get older, they think that their options have increased. No, no, your money has increased. So the options are getting bigger, but the quality is dropping. Whereas when a woman turns 40, 50 years old, she's going to stick to men around the same age and look for something with a bit of substance, usually. When men get older and older, they want someone younger and younger and more attractive. So the substance in the relationship decreases. So even though their options might increase as they age, the substance of the relationship might decrease if they make bad decisions. Do you agree or do you disagree? You look perplexed. No, no, no. But I, I, <laughs> I remember when I was, I mean, you, you tell that story and it, it reminds me of when I, like, you know, you, I asked you a question, I think, last time about our relationships, romantic relationships transaction, transactional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, to some extent they are, but the, the answer is yes and no. They become it? increasingly as you age. Yes, and yeah. the, but, but I also, like, I remember my, my first girlfriend, I was 27, I think, when I, when I was young, younger, and I remember just, I was heartbroken, couldn't get off mm -hmm. the bed. I was just crushed. Aww. And I remember talking with my older sister on the phone back in Chicago and she says she has a way of summing up an entire conversation with one sentence <laughs> and she said I'll never forget it she said there's just something really attractive about a successful man yeah I heard that I said fuck it I'm just going to become successful mm -hmm. and, and that, that has paved the way with, for romantic relationships for me ever since. Mm -hmm. Just makes them flow so much better. Yeah. And yes, that's because I'm offering 
financial security or a better lifestyle or whatever. But isn't that what men offer? Yes, but the thing is, financial security increases access, but it doesn't increase consistency from the woman. Because here's the thing, like I said to you, uh, like, look, in my personal experience, I, the more successful a man is, the worse relationships get for him. But his access increases. He gets more, so he thinks it's almost like fast fashion. You can have more, but the quality is really bad. And here's why. Here's a couple of things that cause it. First of all, when he is hyper successful, he doesn't have the time to vet women properly. When you're running a few, when you're at home by 5 p.m. every day, you can see what she's up to from 5 p.m. every single day. And as a result, you get a real insight into what kind of human being she is. When you are running two, three businesses, you're flying from this area and that area, and she leaves you alone in those days, you're just like, oh, thank God she's not nagging me. No part of you is thinking, what is she doing in those two, three days that I'm away? How come I haven't heard from her? Like, what is she? So essentially what happens is they get, bet they get worse at vetting a woman. They don't get an insight into her true character. So that's the first thing that happens. Now, women who are genuinely loyal, good women, they are incapable of being with men who are so busy. They need emotional connection daily and regularly in order for them to be loyal. So what happens is loyal women naturally can't attach to the man that doesn't know where he's going to, if he's going to be home on Christmas, is he going to be here or not in Thanksgiving. They attach to the man that says, okay, Wednesday we'll go to your mom's house and Friday we'll go here. And they attach to that man because they need consistency. They need emotional consistency. Disloyal women will be distant. So they don't mind if you're going away and going away, going away, but she'll fill that void in some way, shape or form, either through using your money and but like using it with luxury goods and think, oh, it doesn't matter, at least I get to go shopping. But after a while, how much can you buy? And then they form an attachment with the unemployed or a personal trainer who's available every day. So then so that happens, there's a disconnect. And the other thing that happens is they've got so much more to lose. When you get divorced as a successful man, you, I've seen men, successful men, move out of their beautiful homes into a little apartment while she moves in with her side man that she was sleeping with throughout the marriage and they're living on his money and he's funding that. And so I just think your yeah, access increases as you become successful, but your access to good women decreases. Yeah, there's, there's fewer available also. Fewer available. They, they weed themselves out. They don't have a lifestyle that's compatible with a man that's hyper successful. They usually are like home by a certain time, but the men, women that have a lifestyle that's compatible tend to be women who are um, either doing nothing or they may have been in the sex industry at some point. They may have been in sex work at some point in the stage because here's what they learn. They're always around successful men, usually sex workers. And the other thing they learn is if you tell them what they want to hear and then leave them alone, tell them what they want to hear, leave them alone, tell them what you want, leave them alone, you're like their perfect match. And they can play that role very well. Romantic relationships are a minefield, aren't they? Oh, I, I sound so negative and doom and gloom. Can I preface that by saying that's not true? I'm just saying this because worst case scenario. These are worst, worst case scenario. Majority of relationships tend to be healthy, doable, because I'm talking about the 1%, the hyper successful man and the hyper beautiful woman. That's usually what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these things. It can transcend to the average person, but usually this is the, the, the scenario uh, in that end. And the reason why I talk about them is because when you are a therapist, you only work with people who have disposable income. You only work with people who can afford to just pay for a conversation. So as a result, you get an insight into a different mindset. You don't get an insight into, you know, the average man who might just be a teacher and his girlfriend is also a nurse. And so I, I have to make that very clear that I am talking about a minority. It's, it's so beautiful when you see an older couple in their 70s or mm. 80s and they're clearly still in love with each other. Yeah, it is beautiful. It's such a beautiful thing. What do you think what is behind that? I think maturity yeah. on both sides, probably. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they understood that they are growing and changing mm -hmm. and getting older, and they still accept and love each other and yeah. find each other interesting. My parents, who were married for, Jesus, so many decades, I can't count, mm -hmm. they always said, you know, my, my, my dad traveled a lot when he was working early in the relationship, and then my mom traveled a lot mm -hmm. later when she found a new career and started working more. Um, and they, all, they both said that time apart kept the whole thing going. 
Oh, that's good. Because it, it just keeps it fresh. It, and, and I believe that, that like a, a healthy amount of distance is actually really good. The only problem is now we live in a time where distance invites the devil because there's pornography or there's like uh, you know there's alternatives but before it wouldn't necessarily lead to that but now because of the advent of the smartphone distance can invite the devil well what, what kind of things do you think like, like like as a man i can tell you like so many so many women think men just want sex mm -hmm. you give your man sex and he'll be happy mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that's accurate i think no. what men really want is to feel appreciated i i agree i think that the core foundation behind every man and his core reason for cheating is a lack of appreciation. I see men cheating with women that are less attractive, or I see men cheating with, or falling in love with women who are clearly not good for him. But because she made him feel appreciated and desired in a, in a tiny way, he became attracted. And what I find with successful men, the reason why they cheat more is not so much, I, don't, I wouldn't say they cheat more, but if, they, if there is an idea that they cheat more, I would honestly say it boils down to, because success, the more successful you become, the less appreciated they feel. Because what happens with the average man who's splitting the bills and they're splitting the housework, he doesn't feel he's deserving of as much appreciation. So say if she's not as grateful, it's not the end of the world. He might not also be so grateful. And they kind of can accept that. But when you're a man who's provided a really great life for your wife and she's got a really luxury life and she's never had to work or if she does work, it's only up to her and she gets to travel the world in first class and yet she can't even get you a glass of water when you need it or can't even iron a shirt for you so you won't be late in the morning or do, who resents cooking a meal for you, you feel less and less and less appreciated. And it's the lack of appreciation that leads to looking elsewhere. It's not novel sex. And that's what they'd like to think. And sometimes the men think that's what it is. They think I'm craving novelty and novelty sex. But then they'll attach to that one prostitute that made them feel, made them a coffee uh, after they finished. Or they were attached to that one, you know, co-worker that noticed that they cut their hair differently. So they're not actually seeking novel sex as much as they think they are. What is, what is it about sex workers that are attracted makes them attractive to men? Um, because they know how to work low self-esteem. With sex, just like how I have a very skewed vision of relationships because of the work I do. Women who work with men who select um, sex workers can, un can say every single one of them comes to them with either low self-esteem or loneliness. Something is driving them to this connection. And it's becoming more normalized, but essentially, usually those are the uh, fundamental components. There's a low self-esteem or there's a loneliness or an inability to access the women that they find desirable on their own. They can't access that girl, so they'll pay for it. So when you know you're working with low self-esteem, what you ha they know exactly how to manipulate that and engineer that connection into one which they will fall in love. And they know exactly how to make that man fall in love. They know that it's simple compliments, telling them that they're so good at what they do, reminding them that they're so attractive. These kind of compliments, and remember most of these men haven't heard that naturally. So if you say it to them synthetically, they attach very quickly. And also they, they use the same lines as well. A lot of the sex workers will say, I hate this job, I wish I could get out of it. And he's thinking, I'll get you out of it. But she's thinking, oh, this is a lifelong career. In her mind, it's something you don't really come out of. It's very hard to come out of because you lose. Here's, a, here's the biggest thing that what sex work does is you no longer attach exclusivity and loyalty to sexual performance. So it becomes very difficult to be to see sex as that serious. Like if I have sex with another man, why it's not that serious. In their mind, they kind of reduce the significance of sex so much that it becomes easy to cheat. I think it's impossible for these girls to go back to just they a regular... No, monogamy is impossible. And intimacy is impossible. Intimacy is very, very impossible. And I tell you what I really think it is. When, when a woman has been a sex worker and you as a man know that she's been a sex worker and you fall in love with her, in her mind, she knows what she's been doing. And in her mind, she knows the depravity that she's been through. She can't believe you love her. And if you do love her, you must love a different version of her because if you knew the true her, you would not be able to attach to it. So part of her feels like, well, it feels like it's not real when yeah. somebody tries to love them. I, I heard you say once like she has a hard time respecting a man who is going to pay her for sex 
And that's why so many of these girls end up with pimps, because mm. that's the only man that she can respect. Yeah, I did say that. I, well, in my personal experience of working with them, I, look, I, I work with girls who have um, OnlyFans. And I, it's, so, it's so funny to me. I'll have an OnlyFans model, and she might be making 80000 a month. 70% of it goes to her boyfriend because he's the one that's in charge of the OnlyFans. He's the one that's got all the, hired the bots and, you know, drove the traffic. 70% goes to him. And he'll use that money and start sleeping with other girls. And she's hugely loyal to him. Like, she's obsessed with him. Now, th if this is a woman who's got an OnlyFans, she's obviously beautiful. And she obviously has options. There's men paying for her. But she's fiercely loyal to the man that is taking all her money and she's fiercely loyal to her boyfriend and the reason being is she has far more respect for the man that refuses to pay for the OnlyFans but will take money from her but the man that might be subscribing would actually treat her well she would think you're an idiot she can't you can't respect the man that has to pay for you to access you you can't respect that. You'd rather respect the man that you have to pay. And this is something I always tell men because there's a lot of talk that oh, men, women just want financial security. They all want that. But when women are truly attracted to a man, they pay for him. They'll, they'll get an Uber to his house in the middle of the night. They'll bring food to him. He won't have to spend a penny. It's the, men, the more attracted she is, the less you have to invest financially. I, I, I interviewed a, an old, a slightly older sex worker prostitute um, and she said something that I thought was really fascinating she mm -hmm. said that criminalizing a woman's ability to monetize society's most valuable commodity is just a way to keep women powerless I disagree I disagree because yeah, I don't, I don't buy yeah. it 100% but there's some in, it's really an interest, <coughs> interesting thing I, to say. I get what she's trying to say like don't make me a criminal because I'm finally using my power but the reason why I disagree with, I, I think we need to criminalize prostitution, but I actually think we need to criminalize the men that pay. And the reason I say it is they are just rapists with loopholes because the mentality is still the same. You're seeking a woman that doesn't want to have sex but with what, you. What, what about the wives that are no longer interesting? I understand them? that, but if you're a man of caliber, you'll still select a mistress, not a sex worker. Oh, I see. If you're a man of caliber and your wife is no longer interesting, you will still find a mistress. She'll come to you. And the reason why I think the issue is more the men that pay than the women that monetize is the men that pay, the, it, they, are, they are still essentially trying to access a woman who doesn't want them. She's given you permission because you put money in the envelope, but she doesn't truly want you. And then what you're doing is you're paying for violation. You are now putting money in an envelope and now you can violate this woman as much as you want. And yes, she's agreed, so you've got that permission. But the mindset is still that of a rapist. You're paying a stranger who wouldn't normally want to be have sex with you to now have sex with you because you have manipulated consent. Yes, she's agreeing to it, but most healthy women don't agree to that. So you're, you are taking advantage of her traumas, you're taking advantage of her poor financial decisions, you're taking advantage of her low self-esteem, and using that as a way to pleasure yourself. I just think the mindset is still similar to that of men that would have, uh, 200 years ago when this wasn't as available, would have been that man that broke into somebody's house and taken it. And a lot of men will say, no, no, it's nothing like that. And I agree, I, I know I'm being extreme. It's not like that because you found a loophole. But the underlying mindset I find similar. Usually it's men who might be, look, I, I don't know what they like. And nowadays I think it's become very common. But usually there is a considerable age gap. There's a considerable gap in attractiveness. Or there's a considerable gap in performance. One thing I notice is young men who pay for escorts, young men. Um, as you get older, I can understand it's far more convenient. And why would you go on a date with a woman who's 50, who's going to be hard work and not that great in bed? When you can do the same with a 22 year old and it makes total sense. I do understand. It makes total, rationally, it makes total sense. I, I, I can tell you as, a, as an older male, I can t it's, it's crazy how many guys that are old, older and married yeah. that have little things on the side. Yeah, yeah, and paid, paid situations? Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah they have, and I, and I, I don't know, I don't know all the details, but I yeah, just. Yeah, and I understand that because sometimes I'll meet men who are older 
and you know he'll go on a date with a woman that's maybe 40 50 and she's so jaded and so negative and then he's just like oh and she's so difficult and then he's just like oh, i actually don't care enough to start a marriage with somebody i just want to have a nice vacation with a girl so i can understand why he does that but i would say young men in my experience i've worked with some young men who have an addiction to escorts and I, whenever like a wife might come to me and she, her husband's maybe 30 years old, handsome enough, not terrible, and he's going to escorts, the first question I say to the woman, I say, is he bad in bed? And she says, um, well, I, don't, I haven't got much experience, I go, he's bad in bed. I said, I promise you, he's not good at sex. And she say, do you think so? I don't personally have that much experience, so I don't know, I'm used to him. And I said, look, I promise you in this day and age, a 32-year-old man can jump on Tinder and find a girl that day. If he's resorting to escorts, he has either a porn addiction or he's not good. He's not good at sex and he wants to bypass the feedback. He wants to skip the feedback women give you. In the real world, which is very harsh by the way, in the real world what happens is, particularly when you're like 30 to 35 or 20 to 30, whatever, young boys, Girls can tell you, they're, they're shameless, they'll say to you, or they'll imply that they're not uh, pleased with what you're doing. They'll imply it by never calling you again, they'll imply it by getting back with an ex, they'll imply it by their facial expression, whatever it is, they'll imply their satisfaction. Men who have received negative feedback more than once will then skip that and go to an escort. If they, uh, when you're older, slightly different reasons behind it. But young men who are going to escorts are trying to avoid their negative feedback. And there is something in their sexual performance that has caused negative feedback in the past. I would either say it's porn addiction or it might just be size related. I'm really sorry to be crude, but usually because I know women can be really harsh. It's usually that and they want to skip that. And that's why they go to the escorts who give them no feedback. Or they give them positive feedback. Mm -hmm. Do you think that might make sense? This is just my own theory. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no I, I think you're right. But you also get, you know, d given what you do for a living, you're probably seeing a much more negative yeah. segment of society. Segment. Yeah, I'm seeing Because I know there are plenty of people that have really wonderful, fulfilling, respect-filled relationships. Yeah, yeah so many. I mean, lo I mean, loving and being loved is an art. Yeah, it really is. And one thing I would say... Not, I, not everyone can I, master you know, I suffered with really bad anxiety before I met my husband. Really, really bad, really anxious, really... And I thought this was a disease. I thought this is just in me forever. I'm always going to be horrible. I'm always going to be mean. I'm always going to be jealous. I'm always going to be insecure. It's just what I'm going to be. But when you meet somebody that soothes you, every day feels calmer. Every day feels better. Every moment feels better. And, you know, as much as we might say, oh, relationships are so scary and there's this, that and the other, they're scary when we make bad decisions. They really are. Everything is scary when we make bad decisions. Even the food we eat can be really traumatizing to our bodies and stuff if we make the bad decisions. But when we make good decisions, it's, it, it's like, um, it, it's, it's literally cleansing. So when you do find somebody that you can be, feel safe with and make you feel safe, um, you won't believe that your nervous system can calm down so much. So if you are a woman who's always experienced anxiety in relationships and always experienced stress and you just convinced yourself you're just this jealous, anxious person, have a look at your selection because when you do find something more soothing, you will become unrecognizable. You'll be a lot calmer. It's hard to find, but you'll be a lot calmer. There's so many different types of relationships. Some people are into more, I hate to say abuse, but they're, they're into a little more violent mm. style. But for me, like, when you feel like like what you just described, where yeah. your your brain waves, your your yeah. whole mood changes when you're around this person. Yeah, that's that's what you relationship. sleep better. You sleep better. Yeah, everything is you better. Make, you make better decisions in what you eat. Just just by them being around you. Yeah, by just them being around you, and we can cultivate that. We can really cultivate that. And I think one thing that I think men underestimate is if you can avoid pornography and you can avoid liking pictures and you can avoid creating insecurities, it doesn't work on every girl, but if you can generally try and avoid that, it will really help. Similarly, women, if you can avoid taking out all your traumas onto this person and using him as an emotional punching bag, 
it will also help and you'd be grateful rather than being ungrateful which we we all myself included have a habit of doing you can find something really really valuable in marriage and relationships they're they're med medicinal you need it one of the things i've noticed in, especially my dad is getting older and what, you know, doctors in general one of the things they always say and do as soon as a man gets a bit older and he comes into the doctor's surgery the doctor will say have you got a wife and the reason they say that is because they know the chances of survival for anything is higher when you're in a relationship and you're married and I've had, met so many doctors now, the first thing they'll say is, oh, if he doesn't have a wife, oh, he's going to take forever to recover from this surgery, or it's going to take longer. To... So it's really, it's really helpful if you can find someone really good for you. You really do need, you really do need it. We all do. You probably live longer. Yeah, you live longer. And even for women, when they're giving birth, if they hold the hands of their mother or they hold the hands of their husband, the, the pain nerves can tolerate more. So we're just biologically designed to love and be loved. Yeah. You, you, you can talk about relationships all day long. <laughs> I feel like I'm so boring. I feel like I'm, so, I'm like a one-trick pony and I just talk about this all the no, time. No, but this, <laughs> this is something we all need to <laughs> yeah. sort out in our lives. Yeah, I'm so sorry if I'm and, like... No, and without, oh. without advice and knowledge like you have... Praise be to God. I think people would just struggle even for it. No, I hope so. I, I think I was just... Um, my only motivation for coming online is I kept seeing advice that would definitely cause a divorce. I kept seeing advice that you know that was going to destroy marriages, and I, as much as I love um, Andrew's message, Andrew Tate's message, I really do. Overall, I do really admire what he's kind of done for masculinity. But one of the key things that is really going to destroy relationships is teaching the idea that you can be with multiple multiple women and she can just be she just has to accept it and that's how you be the man unfortunately those days are gone where a woman will just let you cheat on her and just stay at home and you want to cheat on her she'll cheat on you ten well, times I, th more. I think a lot of what andrew tate was doing yeah. earlier on was just being controversial just mm -hmm. to get a big name yeah he understood that mm -hmm. probably better than anybody mm -hmm. But now if you listen to him, he actually makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. And I think that, you know, it's, uh, the um, change in religions and just the whole experiences does kind of help you reevaluate your values. And then they usually come back to um, more traditional values. They usually are the only thing that heal you when you've gone through a lot. He's, of he's super intelligent. Yeah, I, I agree very much so. And a, a very good, like orator can speak very well and I think absolutely that's important. no he yeah. great <laughs> yeah he's, he's very, very important very, very important charismatic skill. speaker and he's <laughs> he's wise on top of it I think. yeah i mean in your experience do you think it works if somebody's cheating if the man is cheating can a relationship last never it can't can it not for me mm. even as a man you don't think that it can if if she was cheating or, or you or me no mm -hmm. ne neither way neither way how no. come as a man it still wouldn't work for you if you were cheating it's like i've i, I have tarnished what I had, what I have, and it, it no longer, it, I, I don't respect it as much anymore after I do that. Can a man love the woman the same amount even if he's been cheating on her? I don't think so. I don't think so either. No, the, the, respect, the respect is gone. Mm. I mean, maybe it can be built back somehow, but it would be a tremendous amount well, of work. Well, the duty of care has gone. You would, you would have to really own up to, man, you really fucked up and you just lay yourself bare and Mm. and admit everything and then start over from scratch yeah. and maybe you can rebuild it but it's going to take a long long time it's, and i think the main reason why it is so hard to love the person you're cheating on is because now you can't be yourself with them you're inauthentic you're living two different lives they don't know 50 percent of what you get up to so much of your life is hidden from them now yeah you, you want your secrets to be theirs yeah. you, know, you share them only but with them that's what you don't want to have secrets from them yeah so now the person you live with, you have to wear a mask in front of and hide so much of your life from, you can't be yourself. And I've noticed one of the reasons why men actually fall in love with sex workers or mistresses so much easier is they can drop the mask. Mm -hmm. They can be themselves. I can say to her, oh my God, I've cheated on her so many times when she used to do this and she said this to me and I did that. And they can be themselves and they think they're falling in love with the person, but really they're falling in love with the idea of being themselves again. And they haven't done that in so long. So I think when you are having an affair, and this is men or women, if you think that your partner, one of the reasons I don't encourage, you know, getting back after an affair or, you can get back, but don't believe that they'll never do it again and don't believe that they, you know, it was, they truly loved you. Just remember, in order to maintain that affair, they had to wear a mask in front of you and you had to be not curious about what was going on in their life. It had to be two people that were disconnected. One person was so disconnected that they met another person. The other person was so disconnected that they didn't notice that they met another person. So 
So two people are disconnected. When I see sometimes somebody will say to me, he was having an affair for a year and a half, he got another girl pregnant, or she was having an affair for two years. But in my head, I'm just thinking, how did it get there? How are you so disconnected from your husband or wife that you don't notice that they haven't slept with you the same way, or they've changed their hairstyle, or they bought a bunch of new clothes, or they've been out more often? How have you? How is that disconnected? Has to that disconnect has to be from coming from two people. One person has just used a coping mechanism, but the other person has just ignored the red flags. So I do think that a whole new connection has to take place in order for them to rebuild from an affair. Yeah, no, that's why I said a little while ago. I said love, being in love, loving another person, and being loved is is an art. Yeah. Because to understand how to nurture that respect mm -hmm. and that purity of that connection that you have. Yeah is something you can never let go of. And it's not, not easy just to keep that and, and, and not be too, it's like everything's a balance. Mm -hmm. You can't be too much of this way, but you also have to, you can't be too connected, but you have to, you have, you have to let go, but you also have to stay connected at the same yeah. time. And it's really hard, but the art of staying connected is the only thing that can stop you from having an affair. Um, a lot of people think if we just have good sex or if we just stay on top of our figure and then, then they won't have an affair. But it really is the art of staying connected and uh, you know, trying to see that person, making sure that you're the person that they come to when they feel an emotion. Whether that's sad, tired, hungry, upset, happy, you're the person they share that emotion with. And when you can create that emotional intimacy, it acts as a barrier for, um, for affairs. Yes, things like pornography can have a big influence, but even the fact that you have a husband that watches so much pornography and you don't pick up on that, it should be, it should be evident. Either in their sexual performance or in the things that they're into or the way that they're behaving, the, relate, the sex should feel distant. So if you're not picking up on these addictions or these double lives, you're also to blame for the disconnect. It's a two people job. That's why I think it's important for both men and women to to do something in their life that is that keeps them mentally sharp, keeps them vital, keeps them creative. Yeah, I agree. Because what happens because if, you, if you're just a partner, yeah, it just gets boring quick. It is really, really boring. And I, I can say this even with my own experience when I wasn't doing this and I was a teacher beforehand. There's only so much I could talk about. There's only so much that was I was in, uh, that was invigorating me. I loved the kids. I loved everything that I was doing, but I just wasn't that inspiring to be around and to talk to. I'm not saying everybody is a superhero. Not everybody's inspiring, but have something that gives you a purpose outside of your relationship in order to bring some value to the relationship. And sometimes what men, you know, especially this is one of the advices that I used to hear online a lot. Oh, we don't care what a woman does. As long as she looks beautiful, I don't care what kind of career she has. But if you're an intellectually successful man, you should care what career she does because what do you talk about over dinner? If she's done nothing all day, it gets super unattractive when a man's been busy. And then, and then when, she, when, when she's 70 years old, what, <laughs> what are you going to talk about? What are you going to talk about? And so I think that the lack, of, and this is one of the reasons why I'm always curious when men, you know, want to go to another country and they want to find somebody that's like a quarter of their age. I'm like, but what do you want to talk about? How can you talk about it? because it's important to keep that intellectual intimacy after a while. I know it's really hard when somebody's super beautiful and somebody else is really intelligent. Naturally, you're going to want to go for someone really beautiful. But you've got to remember both of them are going to be less beautiful in time anyway. So the glue to the relationship has to be some intimacy that is outside of the bedroom. Yeah. But how do we tell that to a culture that has been exposed to sexual images from 10 years old? Our job is cut out for us. Yeah, I, th mm -hmm. I think young boys are getting exposed to this stuff. Yeah, and young boys are becoming more predatory than ever before. Uh, sexual assault victims will report that the, the, a lot of the time the perpetrators are the same age because they're so curious. They're kids. They reenact everything they see. So if they watch Power Rangers, they repeat that. But if they're watching porn, they're going to be curious to repeat that. Mm. And we can't blame them because what, what really is is the pop-ups that come up they, and they're cartoons with big boobs, and they just naturally touch, and accidentally they're onto, they're catapulted into porn. Does, does working with people who are going through all these kind of problems constantly, day in, day out, does it get to you? If I'm honest, it makes me grateful. I know that sounds really pompous, and I hate saying that. I really, I don't mean that in a pompous way. 
But you know when you zoom out, because you can fight with your partner over the smallest things. You can fight with your partner if they didn't call you at the certain time that they said, and this, that, and the other. But when you zoom out and you look at the world and you think, on the whole, do I have somebody that respects me and do I respect them? If I have that, the grass is not greener. And I think if anything, what it's done is even though my social media has grown, my exposure has grown, it's made me more reclusive and more stick to the people I already knew rather than expanding my net because you realize the grass is not greener outside. You know like how my job exposes me into some of the things, your job also does oh, yeah, that too. Oh yeah, for sure. Did it make you more grateful or did it make you more like miserable? Like? No, it, it, it stressed me out. <coughs> how? Because, you know, especially when I was interviewing lots of drug addicts and prostitutes and people from the streets, along with those interviews comes a lot of hustling and deceit and conning and just just stuff that I'm not normally exposed to. Mm -hmm. and, and you get 50 phone calls a day or 50 texts a day of people like trying to angle for this, trying to get that, oh. trying to get everybody wants something from me. Everybody wants something from it, and it's just, it just wears on you. I wouldn't be able to do your job because... I can't do my yeah, job. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do your job because I have the luxury, and this is a very luxury version of mental health concerns, because it's people that can afford to pay, mm -hmm. and it's people that have the, the self-awareness to these get to... these people have nothing. Your people have nothing. And in my experience, when I used to be more accessible and a lot cheaper before, when I became a bit bigger, the quality of people were people that didn't want to pay. Even though it was super, super cheap, they didn't want to pay and they were trying to scam me out of things and so on. And as I got more, as I raised my prices, the caliber of people just happened to be people who were happy to, you know, pay. So I found it, it the uh, high end was just easier to work with. Yeah, I'm trying to do the same thing. It's so hard in your just, industry. But, but, but branching out, I'm getting a better... Better quality. Better qu better. Because they must pull at your heartstrings a bit because you know they have nothing. It's not like they're pretending. You kind of know they have nothing, but then at the same time, you're not everybody's... But I've, I've, yeah. done, I've done thousands of these. Yeah. That's enough. And that's how I feel. Sometimes people will come to me and say, oh, you charge so much for one-to-ones. I'm not, you know, that bad, but they'll say you charge so much or you're trying to make money out of it. And I'm just thinking, I give enough content online that is more than what you would get from no, 100 those, therapy people sessions. People that make those kind of comments don't understand all the years and effort and work and time that you spent to learn. honing your yeah. skill and, and building this base of knowledge that you have yeah. that you're sharing. I don't feel any guilt from it only because I've done enough free stuff. I genuinely think if you can't afford it, I have the reason I have no guilt towards it is because I put so much out there for free. Yeah, you can, so you can learn everything you need to learn everything. just from the videos you put out. Just from the videos. But the funny thing is every time I have a client, they'll leave the call and say, I didn't expect you to say that. I've watched all your content. I didn't think you would say that. And I said, yes, but I tailor it to the circumstance I'm in. So because, you know, they, sometimes they'll think I'm going to discriminate against them. What, what, what are the most common things a client will, will complain to you about? The most common situation I do experience is men falling in love with gold diggers or escorts. Because really? this, this is the rich man's problem. And from a woman's perspective, the most common is she is on the receiving end of that. She's on the receiving end of a husband that's, you know, she's caught him spending money on escorts and this and that's the most common. This is one of the reasons I talk about it so much. So many, so many rumors online. Is it like an <laughs> epidemic of men that are yes. falling yeah. for sex workers? There is an epidemic because either they're, fall not only are we got men that are falling in love with escorts, now what's happened is women have, because they see that, women's um, shame towards becoming an escort has disappeared. So I would say most of the Instagram models that you see, it's a catalog for escorts because every holiday that they've been on, the, the problem with men is that they're so blind to the signs. They're so blind. They're like, oh, no, 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 she would never, she's not like that. No, no. And she doesn't even work. She doesn't have money. That's why I gave her money. And, and for her Instagram will be full of, um, she's in Italy, she's in Paris, she's in this, and they don't connect any of the dots. So uh, the, the, the problem I'm, I see most is that. That's the problem I see, that's the model. But the bigger problem, the underlying problem is pornography. The reason I talk so much about pornography is you can come to me with any problem. And I, the first question I'll ask is, is there pornography? I've had couples that have come to me and they said, I've been, we've been to three or four therapists, Every, you're our last hope. And when I have one of them alone, I say, I, you tell the truth, are you addicted to pornography? But w w once a man has been exposed to some hardcore stuff, uh, uh, pornography, do you, th do you think he can ever straighten out and 
I think it takes a long time of no... You you have to, like, be pure. You have to be pure. So that even the slightest sexual interaction becomes And and it's hard, even with Instagram. So they think, oh, no, no, I haven't watched porn for a while, but their Instagram feed is terrible, or their Twitter feed is terrible. So it really takes a detox. And the other problem, here's the bigger problem, people don't know when they're an addict. So I'll have a a client, maybe he's 46 years old, and I said, do you watch pornography? Not that much, just twice a week or something, once a week. And I said, okay, when did you start? Oh, when did the internet start? 2001. And he's like, okay, about 20 years. I was like, 20 years of watching pornography. And, and he th- they think, but I'm not an addict because I can stop any time. I'm like, but why haven't you? And then I go, oh, it just helps me sleep. They don't realize that when pornography starts to be used as a device for something else that, that it should never, be, it's not really got a purpose, but if it's helping you sleep or it's helping you avoid relationships, it's serving an extensive purpose and therefore it's an addiction. It's no, I don't think it has any purpose, but if it did have a purpose, it's going beyond that now. Well, what do men see in these kind of women? Uh, in the pornography? Yeah. The ability to see a woman that would never want to be naked with them. A woman that would never choose to be naked in front of them, they now get an insight into that. Which is why OnlyFans does so well. Because they get these influences that they could never get in a million years. But now they get an access to see what she looks like naked. And I genuinely think, men, you tread a fine line between being the protector and the predator. We are looking for the protector, the guy that we've chosen to protect us. Predator is we haven't chosen you, you want us. So when you are paying for this, you are treading down the predatory line. Because I know she's giving you permission, but she, she doesn't desire you. So you know that this is not reciprocated. Why do you want to engage in sexual relationships or sexual satisfaction where you are, the desire for you is not reciprocated? Mm. I, don't, I know I sound like a grandma saying this, but it's just I can't understand the concept. I don't know if it's my pride or if it's the way I know I'm a woman, it's different. There would be no part of me that takes joy in seeing the nudity of a man that doesn't want me. Part of my attraction to you is that you want me equally. No, but, but it's like an addictive drug. You know, Once you're exposed to it, you, it was a pleasurable experience, so you want to do it again. Yeah, and the pleasure overrides the pride. Mm-hmm. And that, you don't really yeah. see the price right then and there. Yeah, you don't see it. But I, and also, I have to really preface this with the fact that I've never watched pornography. And I talk so much about it. Sometimes I think I should watch it just to get an insight into what I'm talking about. But I just can't sit there. It, the voyeurism makes me feel too uncomfortable. But that also might be because of my religion. I, I, I'm Personally, I never feel like... It's a secret. I always feel like, oh, God's going to watch me and I'm going to be in trouble, blah, blah, blah. So I've still got that kid in me that thinks it's haram and I'm going to get in trouble. So I've never actually watched pornography, but I definitely should. At one point, I might watch it just to see what it does. And you also haven't done drugs? Oh, no, never done. I've never tried alcohol. So tonight's, we're going to have some fun tonight. <laughs> Impossible. I think the gateway to drugs is usually alcohol. If you've never tried alcohol, it's very difficult to then go on to drugs. I'm going to get you drunk. We're going to get uh, high. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I think that's what's kept me. But please don't take this to mean that I'm a good person in any way, shape or form. This is simply because of the restrictive upbringing I had. And me, the type of person I am, because I feel like I'm so full of vices anyway, the last thing I need to do is add substances to me because I'm so brazen as a human being and I'm so fearless that if I ever started indulging in drugs and alcohol, I'd be in jail. No, but I, I believe you, I, I agree with you 100% on the yeah. porn thing. Yeah, how come you agree with that? I, I just see how it it oversensitizes men, mm-hmm. but it's to me it's the courage thing. Yeah, courage is a huge part of being a man. Yeah, and w- what courage is needed when you're watching porn? Exactly. None. But you go to approach a beautiful woman like like yourself, it takes all the courage. You got you guys will shake in their boots and, before they'll approach a woman. And it's always, I, you know, it's, I know it sounds terrible, but sometimes I can tell by looking at a man if he's watching too much pornography. And, and they'll say, how can you tell by looking at a man? And I said, listen, if I can see a man that's single and he's super overweight and he's not taking care of himself and his bedroom is a mess, he's addicted to pornography. Because any man who didn't have that outlet knew living like this means no sex and they would fix it. But because they've got that outlet, they can continue to live in a way that's unattractive to humans, not just women, humans. So I can almost tell by looking at a man that he might be addicted to pornography. So it's always good, I think, to look back at how humans lived before all this technology, mm. before all, you know, all this advancement that came in our, our world. 
and, and that's probably how we should be living. And what, did, what were women most attracted to? Courage. Because yeah. it would take courage to go hunt and gather. It would take courage to come and impregnate. It would take courage to work, build in tribes. You would never be in tribes with a man that had no courage. So um, I think anything as a man, if you kind of think about all the things that scare you and you lean more towards avoidance, you're losing your masculinity. And if women scare you, you uh, that's the big, you've lost your masculinity. Try and try and make that something you're not afraid of. And you can only build a resist resilience against fear against women when you have a willingness to leave them, a willingness to walk away. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But if you're a man that's just itching to be with a woman, Unfortunately, you lose all your courage and she can smell that off you and the, the breakup is inevitable. Mm. Yeah. So hard being a man, isn't it? It is. It's really hard. Yeah. What, I wonder what's hard about being a woman. What do you think is hard about being a woman? Getting older. Getting older, that's true. Getting older. Here's the thing I would say, the hardest thing about men and women. I think men, you have to really work on yourself psychologically to be attractive. But for women, ours is more physically. And if we don't have that, it's very, we're very limited and it's, and it's depreciated. But, I, but I've seen women at my gym who are... Late 30s, 40s, 50s, yeah. probably 60s too. They're just unbelievable. Oh, that's good to hear. Unbelievable. I, I, but I would say to women in general, and I always say this to women, is... But I'm, uh, I'm, in, I'm in Los Angeles. I'm yeah, going to, I'm and going so to in Dubai. Gym. I'm in Dubai, so everybody's Instagram. But what I do say to women, I was like, it's unreasonable to expect your husband to still be attracted to you when you let yourself go. It is totally unreasonable. And if you've really gained a lot of weight and you become a different woman and then he has an affair and you're shocked... You can't be shocked. You, I know it's not nice to hear, and I know that a lot of them are going to go, oh, you're such a misogynist. It's just a fact of life. If I let myself go completely, and I'm a completely different person to the month that my husband signed up for, it doesn't make it right, but it's inevitable that he's going to not be attracted to me. Now, some men will stick with you and never be unfaithful, but that doesn't change the fact that they still aren't attracted to you. Some men won't cheat. They literally won't cheat but they do lose attraction. And they've just almost kind of castrated that part of themselves. But no man is going to be attracted to that over the years. So if you feel like you can deprive men of the thing that they probably value a lot in a relationship, which is attractiveness, then unfortunately they're going to seek it elsewhere. So, and I'm not saying that's every man, but we owe it to our partners to remain someone somewhat in the ballpark of what they signed up for. But having a bunch of kids and then becoming a different human being and then complaining that he's not interested in you is just a little bit neglectful. Discipline, courage, and hard work. Could, could you be attracted to a woman if she totally changed physically? Meaning like put yeah, on 40 gained pounds? Gained a, a lot of weight. No. Yeah, unfortunately. I could still be attracted to a woman, no, I, mean, I, I don't I, think I, they I could, could be I could, me. I could appreciate her yeah. as a friend or as mm -hmm. a partner, but mm -hmm. as a... Sexual partner? No. It won't happen. No. It just won't happen. And here's the thing. When you let yourself go, and it's so hard, I completely understand. When you've had kids who, like, some of them don't have time for the gym, and they're working, and they don't have time for it, I completely, completely understand that it's not easy. But life's not easy. And the reason why I say it's important to stay on top of that is because then they can't, you know, the porn excuse can't be used. That I had to, and the other thing is what intimacy between couples does. Like usually when I have a couple that really are fighting and they're really not seeing eye to eye, usually the physical intimacy is gone. When you fight with somebody day in, day out, but you have physical intimacy, you start to become neutral again. You almost get to a state of neutrality. But without that physical intimacy, it's almost like living with your annoying sibling. Like, you just, they're so annoying, you hate them. And you don't even have any physical connection. So you just end up building more and more frozen anger towards each other. So physical intimacy is really, really important in keeping that marriage alive. And you have to put the ingredients in place for good physical intimacy. It's not always going to be exciting. It's going to get incredibly boring at times. But you at least take care of yourself enough to be as pleasing as you were in, relatively uh, in the beginning. Do, do you see people in your practice, couples, who actually fix things and get, get back to where yeah, they should be? Yeah, a lot of the time they can. And the, and the main thing that really helps that get them back on track is when they both acknowledge where they let each other down. Couples that don't get back on track are the ones that believe they did nothing wrong and their partner's just inherently a bad person. They think he's just bad or she's just bad. But couples that think our marriage broke down because certain things weren't in place, they can really recover and they make little steps to make the relationship better. And those little steps, we call them bids for affection. 
what are bid for affection and how this often leads to a divorce is any emotion your partner's feeling your partner should receive it and what i mean by this if i come home and i say oh i'm so tired today and if i have a partner that just ignores me or says oh what are you tired about i'm the one that did this immediately we build friction but if i have a partner that says hey why what happened are you okay do you want to rest for a bit that builds intimacy again and having a partner then shift from being negative about that to responding to each other's emotions no matter how small it might be that builds love and affection again so there is hope always so you, every emotion your partner feels you just respond to it doesn't mean you fix it you just respond to it i'm so tired why what's wrong hey watch this look at this video look at this picture okay give me one second i'll come and look at it it's that interaction that keeps people together but when you have a partner that you're trying to talk to them and then they're on their phone the whole day or you look upset and they don't even notice you start to build resentment well what do you think the cause of most breaks breakups is now it's that it's ignoring the emotion it's literally that. So what will happen is it might be like um, a, a woman might feel like she was really upset about something and her husband just didn't notice. Or the man might say he was, did really well at work and she was never proud of him. It's just these little emotions. Makes, it makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. He might have been really excited about a deal and she was just either indifferent or negative. And it's just not sharing each other's emotion it makes you look for somebody who does share that emotion with you. Uh, or just build resentment to your partner. That and excessive criticism. Sometimes partners, they criticize each other a lot. What, we really, what the research has found, you have to give five times as much praise as you do criticism. You can criticize your partner, but just make sure there's more towards praise. And then you can always find praise if you want to. It can be as simple as, oh, babe, thanks for making the bed, or oh, um, can you make that tea the way you make it? You make it so good. Small things, you can easily add praise. But how people set themselves up for a divorce is they find the flaw in every scenario. And is that the fun out of the relationship? I've heard it said before where in, in romantic relationships, you want to have five positive interactions, I think, to one. That's the Gottman the, uh, study. Yeah, it, they're, they're really good. If you are struggling, I recommend not watching me, watching the Gottman Institution, because they really do teach you all about repair. I kind of am like the apocalypse, like this is how bad it is. But they really, really Because when a relationship is just too perfect and smooth, <laughs> it, it becomes flat and boring. The, the thing is, the flat and boring, for people that grew up with healthy environments, flat and boring is all they knew. They only knew consistency and monotony. So that's why they have a head start for relationships because relationships to get really the success comes when you can accept the flat and boring. So you so you don't need to have that negative interaction no, every five times. I know people like it. They like since so look. You should definitely have. Some I, conflict. I typically don't. You know, you need some conflict because no conflict means both of you are not expressing yourselves. So some couples have no conflict whatsoever. Yeah, but one, one out of six is a, would be a lot for me. One out of six. Uh, you, having, you, having a fight. You ever fight? Rarely, yeah. but, but it's happened. And w w do you not fight because you don't find anything to fight about, or do you suppress it? No, I don't find anything to fight about. Nothing bothers you? No. So if you do start fight, or do have something, what would it be about? Um, Has there ever been a theme that upsets you about women? Something somebody did that was just like inappropriate, or, or, or like in, in, a, in a business get-together, she said or did something that really just was... What, what, it wasn't your night. It wasn't your night to say that. It wasn't uh -huh. like. But you just don't fight generally. It's not, it doesn't come naturally. You're not confrontational for no reason. No, no, never. Oh, okay. That's good. Then, but then in relationships, doesn't that make it really easy to be with somebody like you? Yeah, I, I have really good luck. Yeah, okay. And then so when they don't work out, what is the cause? Mm, I've had girls put on weight, like you mentioned. Okay. Um, Do you lose sexual attraction? What's that? Do you lose sexual attraction? Yeah, okay. totally, totally. And do you lose it fast? Fast. Yeah, and then um, do you express it or do you just wait for them? Or do you? I try. I try to say it because you know. Oh, you're putting on weight, honey. It's like, what are you? Like, <laughs> nobody here. Nobody do wants you to hear. Express or do you withdraw? Because men usually go. They either say it or they just withdraw sexually. I, 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 I withdraw. You withdraw. Yeah. The the other thing that would kill it for me is uh, not feeling appreciated. Okay. That's probably what led to my divorce. And what what does appreciation look like for you? I mean, like, I, I tend to set, uh, you know, the, the lifestyle that I provide is pretty great. Praise be to God, yeah. And you would think that the person that's receiving that better life would, would be like... Thank you. <laughs> treat you like a king. No. Not that I need to be, have no. my ass kissed, but just not 
feeling like the opposite of that. And what would treating you appreciating, would that be, what, what would be a gesture that would make you feel appreciated? Do you need verbally or do you verbally. need like acts of service? Or no, just verbally. Verbally, okay. And that doesn't even happen goes, as well? It goes a long way with me. Yeah. And th even that is hard to get sometimes in the wind? Well, I mean, just in, in one case. Mm -hmm. Okay. And even when you expressed it, would they still struggle? Oh, I, I wasn't, see, I'm not that aware sometimes of uh, what's going on, the dynamics of a relationship. You don't know why you're feeling this way. All I know is I met somebody else and mm. that felt, felt appreciation. So that, yeah, it's like that was yeah. the end of it. But I would say one trait that men need to look for in women is a woman who's naturally grateful. Grateful, uh, and they say, oh, we don't like entitled women, but here's the problem which men have. When a woman is not grateful, it actually makes a man work harder for her. Because let's say, for example, you take her to a nice restaurant and she's a bit unimpressed. If you're attracted to her enough, you just take her to an even better restaurant. And yet, So what ends up happening is... You Guys invest, will put up with a lot of crap. They'll put up with a lot of crap. So what happens is if they meet a girl she's attracted to and she's just like, hmm, hmm. Instead of being like, no, they'll be like, okay, let me do more. So they end up investing more and more into entitled women. Whereas the woman that expects less, they give her less. So they end up investing in the wrong women. And uh, men, we, well, not we, <laughs> men, you guys fall in love with whoever you invest in. It, here's the problem that a lot of grateful, non-entitled women find. They find that because they are so grateful for the small things and because they don't ask for a lot, men don't give them a lot. Because there's some women out there that will just be happy with the takeaway and just be, you know, don't need a lot. So what they find is men don't give them a lot. But that same man might meet a gold digger two years later and you see that he's buying her a car and he's taking her here. And, he's, and she's thinking, I didn't ask for anything because I was so grateful to be with you, but you didn't reward that gratitude. But they reward the entitlement of other women. Well, see, to, to me, to my way of thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but I always feel like it's my job to motivate her to want to motivate me, How to inspire me. What does that mean? Be so physically attracted, be so appreciative, okay. be so fun to hang out with, be so whatever, whatever great quality she has. Because what women sometimes feel is that the more you kind of have accept the bare minimum just to show him that you're not there for the wrong reasons the worse they treat you and whereas when you are that woman that says is this it you just got one bentley my ex had two men work harder for that girl so they just learn that men reward entitlement and they don't really reward gratitude there are so many women that they'll feel like they didn't ask for anything, never expected anything, whatever it is, and they got nothing in return. And there's other women who are just by design gold diggers, by design entitled, and they get things straight away. And so what- Yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah? yeah, and so that's why it feels a bit like, it's so strange what men reward. So that's why we, we wanna be grateful, and we wanna be low maintenance, but we realize when we do that, you treat us less well. Uh, so my advice to men would as, be... As long as you keep the guy physically attracted to you, yeah. I think you're in, you're, in you're, great good. Shape. you're in great shape. <laughs> yeah, I would say my advice to men is always to reward grat grateful women. Reward those women. Don't reward the entitled woman who wants more and more and more and more. Reward that woman that doesn't ask for anything, who doesn't might not ask for anything, she still deserves it. I know men who says, oh, my ex was such a gold digger. She lo left with all my money. My new wife is amazing. She doesn't ask for anything. I don't have to buy her anything. Yes, yeah, st st stinginess is a, uh, it's uh, not a good quality. It's not good. So reward, reward gratitude in women. Women that are grateful just because they don't ask doesn't mean they don't deserve. Reward those women rather than the entitled ones because the more you invest in entitled women, the more you'll want the relationship to work because you've just invested so much. Mm -hmm. So reduce your investment to I, women. I, I find because I'm, I'm very, I tend to be generous. Yeah. When I am generous, I'm more attracted. Yeah, because she, she, it's a weird, it's, I, I don't and understand and, it, but and I mean, it's so interesting. It's almost like a fetish. Do, yeah, it's so interesting because I live in Dubai and I work with lots of different types of women. One thing I notice about Eastern European women is they require investment. They require investment and men are addicted to that because they want to see, like, men are still businessmen at the end of the day. When you invest in something, you're more dedicated to it. If I put $10 into a Bitcoin, I don't really care if Bitcoin's up or down, but if I put 10 million, I now am loyal to my Bitcoin. Same thing applies to women. The more you invest in her, the more you want it to work out. So, because you don't want to see a loss in your investment. So make sure you're investing in the right ones. 
Great advice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Sadia, always interesting. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Hope. Thanks. All right, we'll do this again, hopefully. Inshallah.